Hello, Code Camp. Hello, Bucharest. It's awesome to be back. Uh, I was here last year on the same stage, and this is one of the most awesome venues that uh, I've ever had the joy of speaking in. And the party last year was fantastic. So I said, let's come back. We'll do the same thing, bigger party, everything. Unfortunately, someone brought the rain, but it's all right. We've moved everything tonight indoors, so that's going to be cool. But first, we're going to talk about text. We are going to talk about plain text for the next 45 minutes or so. And some people are thinking, are you really going to get 45 minute talk out of plain text? Yep. Yes, I am. Now, there are two things I need to say at the beginning of this talk. One, there's a lot of stuff in this talk which I learned traveling around Ukraine and Belarus and Russia. I did lots and lots of trips out there. I've done lots of conferences in those countries. I've spoken to uh, startups and tech hubs. Now, the world now is a very different place to the world that existed when I got the chance to meet these people and learn all this stuff. And some people said, you really still want to do the talk? Yes, I still want to do the talk. Because all of the stuff that I'm going to show you here is uh, it's all part of a story that informs the technology that we work with every day. Technology that was built, most of it, by smart people trying to solve important problems and trying to do so in a way that respected different languages and cultures and alphabets and all that kind of stuff. Now, the other thing to bear in mind about this talk is that this talk has been up on YouTube because I did a version at an NDC in Oslo a couple of years ago, and they put the video up. And people on YouTube have opinions. And the version I did in Oslo was called There's No Such Thing as Plain Text. And uh, somebody popped up and said in the comments, of course there's such a thing as plain text. Plain text is the text in the text plain mime type, or more generally, text blah, 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 Yeah. Some people on YouTube <laughs> have way too much spare time. 850 words later, this comment says that apparently Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to go back time and time and kill my parents. Um, now, uh, this is one kind of YouTube comment. There's also a bunch of people on YouTube who just contributed interesting ideas, and they added stuff I didn't know and explained little details in the talk. So uh, yeah, I'm going to weave some of those things in as we go along. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about plain text. now. Most of the time, when we talk about something being a plain text file, what we mean is, don't make me think. Don't make me buy special software. I don't want license. I just want something I can open in my favorite editor. And a lot of our ideas about plain text go back to this. This is 7-bit ASCII, defined in the United States in 1965. Now, I'm guessing that most people in this room, like ASCII's been there since before we were born. Because ASCII's getting pretty old now. And so this is just something we've all grown up with. Like when we started playing around with computers, yeah. Day one, you start typing and then you figure out what ASCII is. It's kind of weird to think ASCII was designed. Like a bunch of engineers sat down and went, oh, we'd better come up with an encoding system. And the thing you've got to remember about ASCII, it was built when computers looked like this. And it was built when they didn't have screens. They had teleprinters, and they didn't have disks. They had paper tape. And so the design of the ASCII character set was smart solutions to the kind of problems you had when this was the equipment that you had on your desk. Now, if we look at that basic 7-bit block of ASCII, you'll notice there's a bunch of characters. We start off with all the zeros. Any of you ever written code in C, C++? Null terminated strings, right? Yeah, what a brilliant idea. Like, what could possibly go wrong? And then we get what are called the control characters. And these were the characters on your teleprinter. If you wanted it to do something, you'd hold down control, and you'd press A to say, hey, this is the start of a heading, control and A. Or start of text, control and B. Or if your teleprinter is printing and printing and printing, and you're like, no, 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 stop, 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 you'd press control C. And that one still works. And that's why when your .NET program goes into an infinite loop, you send it a signal that was designed to stop a mechanical teleprinter. Now, we got another couple of control characters, and then we get the tabs. The tab, the line feed, the vertical tab. If anyone ever argues with you about the best way to indent code, tell them that you indent your code with vertical tabs, and then you just walk away and leave them to think about it. And then we have the form feed and the carriage return. Now, to understand where these came from, and to understand one of the biggest problems that people encounter with plain text, you need to think about a teleprinter. Because a teleprinter has a thing on it called a carriage. And the carriage rattles across the page, and it prints letters. And when you get to the end of the line, you have to return the carriage, and then you need to feed the line. Now, teleprinters were a little bit primitive. They couldn't do much. One of the things they could do is they could fake bold. Because you could print a line, and then you could carriage return, and then you could print the same line again. 
and it would kind of look bold because it wouldn't quite line up properly, so the characters would get a bit heavier. And this meant that being able to do a carriage return on its own was useful, something people wanted to be able to do. And so when the, uh, if any of you have ever come across this situation, where Linux is like, it's a slash n, and Windows is like, no, slash r slash n, that's all backslash r backslash n. This is because Linux and Mac OS, they evolved out of Unix. And Unix evolved from an old operating system called Multix. And Multix was the first operating system in history to have device drivers, which meant you could put a little piece of code between your operating system and your teleprinter that said, look, if they send us a new line, do a carriage return as well, because that's obviously what you want. Whereas Windows evolved out of, well, Windows, what are we on, 11? evolved out of 10, evolved out of 8, evolved out of Vista, evolved out of all the way back to MS-DOS, which evolved out of or was borrowed from CPM. And CPM was built to run on mini computers. And mini computers were cheap. And one of the ways they made them cheap is they didn't have device drivers. So if you wanted a carriage return and a line feed, you had to send a carriage return and a line feed. Now, the next block of ASCII here is the digits, the decimal numbers. And one of the things computers have to do a lot is they have to take a number that makes sense to humans and turn it into a number that makes sense to a processor and then turn it back into a number that makes sense to humans because we read numbers in different ways to CPUs. And the way you do this with ASCII is you ignore the big half. You just take the bottom four bits and that's the numeric value of that digit. And that's fast. Even on a four-bit CPU, that is a really fast operation. Have you ever wondered why you look at a block of ASCII like this, you're like, well, why is, is uppercase A 65 and lowercase A 97? What is the significance of those numbers? The reason they chose those numbers, they are one bit different. If you look at these uppercase and lowercase strings in 7-bit ASCII, the only bit that's different is that one. So if you ignore that bit, you can do case insensitive sorting. So you can do case-insensitive string comparison, case-insensitive sorting in text files, those kinds of things. There's a bunch more punctuation and stuff gets mopped up. And finally, right at the bottom of the 7-bit ASCII block is delete. And the reason why delete is 1111111 is if you want to delete information from a paper tape, you can't fill the holes back in. I mean, you can put tape over them, but then your enemies will take the tape off and discover all your secret files. The only way to delete it is to punch out all the rest of the holes. So if you write delete onto paper tape, it punches all the holes out, and no one can see what was on the tape before. So the Americans, they pat themselves on the back, and they're like, hey, good job, Chad. 127 characters, all you're ever going to need. And the rest of the world goes, what? We can't work with this. Now, depending who you are and where you are in the world, for some people, um, ASCII was just a joke. Like, it didn't even come close. Anyone at Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Arabic writing systems, nah, not even the same ballpark. For Western Europe and Northern Europe, it was almost close enough. Now, I'm British. I actually spent my childhood in Zimbabwe and Africa, where the currency was dollars and cents, and I grew up speaking English. So ASCII was fine for me until I was 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, I moved to the UK, and I'd done some homework on the computer, and I wanted to print it, and I couldn't print this. And I couldn't print it because the Americans hadn't included it, and so my computer and my printer could not agree on what sequence of bits was supposed to be used to represent this sign. Now, this happened all over the world, different companies, countries, organizations, they're all looking at ASCII, and they're all going, well, OK, we've got this, this seven-bit block that the Americans have done, but we've got eight bits in a byte. What about the other half? Is anyone using this bit? And it turns out, no. Well, nobody was kind of standardizing that bit, and so lots of different people jumped on it and went, right, <coughs> we got an idea. We're going to use the top half of ASCII to solve our problem. And this happened all over the world, and thousands of different implementations sprang up. Now, this is known as a code page. A code page is basically a rule that says, this right here, this computer, this document, this format, today, this is what the top half of ASCII means. One of the most common code pages in history was this one. This is code page number 437, and this shipped with the IBM PC and became very, very common in DOS and console applications. Now, they did a couple of interesting things with this. One, they included all the characters necessary for most of Western and Northern Europe. So France, Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark, all these kinds of countries and places. They included all these line drawing characters. They included half of the Greek alphabet. You know why they included half? 
They didn't care about Greek, they cared about maths and physics. And so they picked the Greek characters which were used in kind of high level, uh, high school level mathematics and physics and went, well, we'll put those in so people can do maths and physics on the computer. And then they came up with the bright step of going, well, the IBM PC is a computer, it doesn't have a teleprinter, we can use the control block to do more characters. And that's why when an IBM PC crashes really hard, you get a screen full of playing cards and smiley faces because it's taking all of these low-valued opcode instructions, machine-level instruction 0, 1, 2, 3, and it's trying to render them in the default code page. Now, there's a whole bunch of code pages. There were code pages for doing the Cyrillic alphabet for Russia and Ukraine, Belarus, these kinds of places. But the standard code page for doing that, the one that was part of the international standard, it didn't work, and it kind of sucked. And the reason was, if you took a word like Privyet, and you set it using the international standard code page, you would end up with this sequence of bytes. But there were a lot of systems out there that still assumed text only used seven bits. There was an old operating uh, word processor called WordStar. WordStar used the eighth bit as a parity check to tell whether a letter had been spell checked yet. A lot of email systems would strip off the eighth bit in transit. So if you lost your eighth bit, you'd end up with this, and you'd turn it back into text, and you'd get, we don't know what that says. That's complete gibberish. So the Russians came up with the Kod Emnama Informatia Vosembit, KOI8. And this is a really neat hack, because what this did is it took the Cyrillic alphabet, and it went, never mind alphabetical order, let's pick the Latin characters, the basic ASCII characters that sound the same. And so if you lost your eighth bit in transmission, when you turned it back into text, you'd get something you could kind of read. And they'd flip the upper and lower case to make it obvious that it had been messed up. But this was a kind of, you know, it was a stable encoding. You could still read it even if you'd lost that top bit. Now, I did this talk at a user group in the UK last year. Someone came up to me afterwards and said, do you know about the Harry Potter book? I'm like, no, tell me about the Harry Potter book. And they pointed me at this wonderful story that I, I found online on a discussion forum. Around 2002, uh, there's a woman in France who has a pen friend in Moscow, and they're emailing backwards and forwards, and they're both Harry Potter fans. And uh, Svetlana is in Moscow, and Claudette says, hey, do you want me to send you the new Harry Potter book? And uh, Svetlana's like, yeah, please, uh, send it to me. We can't get the new Harry Potter book in Russia yet. Um, here's my address. It's in the Russian alphabet. Please copy it carefully and gives a street address in Moscow, written in Cyrillic, and sends this email to uh, Claudette. And Claudette reads it on French language Windows 2000 using Outlook, and gets that. But hey, it's in the Russian alphabet. Please copy it carefully. Now, this is the same data being interpreted using a different code page. It's the same sequence of bytes being rendered using different conventions. So Claudette follows the instructions, and she writes exactly what came through and sends this letter. And somebody inside the Russian postal service looks at it and goes, I know what that is. And they work out where to send it, and the book gets delivered. Now, these kinds of international encoding things, you know, the days when we didn't have a, an international convention for alphabets. Um, I want everyone here, get your, get your phone out of your pocket now, and go and open up Spotify or Google Play, whatever it is that you use to listen to music. And uh, I want you to search for that word. Anyone found anything? Billy Joel, live in Leningrad. So 1987, Billy Joel becomes one of the first Western artists to play concerts in the Soviet Union. And uh, he does a concert in uh, Leningrad, a city which is now St. Petersburg, and that is recorded and it's released. And it's called Concert. But on the cover of the album, they write the word concert in Cyrillic. And then this gets to somebody at Sony Music Publishing or whoever the record company is, and they're like, oh, I gotta put this in the database. Uh, K-O-H-U-E-P-T, all right? And that would just have been some obscure catalog, but then streaming comes along, and iTunes comes along, and Spotify comes along, and they go to all these record companies, and they're like, do you have a database of like, all of your copyrighted music so we can add it to our platform? And they go, yeah, yeah, have the database. And so you find little things like this, albums where the title of the album is not in ASCII, and so we've ended up with these weird transliteration errors that are just part of history now. Now, 
there's another weird quirk about the Cyrillic alphabet in music. Um, do any of you read Cyrillic? Anyone in here? Can anyone read that? Nobody can read that. That's nonsense. That says if the chair. But if you type that on a Cyrillic keyboard layout, this is the pattern that your fingers make. And if you make that same pattern on a US keyboard layout, it spells Taylor Swift. And Google knows about this, because if you go onto Google and you've forgotten to switch from Russian back to American keyboard layout, and you type Taylor Swift, Google knows what you meant, even though you've got the wrong layout. Now, I have no idea what kind of encoding this even is, but somebody inside Google was getting sick of switching keyboard layouts. They're like, you know what? Let's just let Google figure this out. Like, if I accidentally type Taylor Swift, yeah, we know what you're looking for. Now, this code page situation created chaos. This is the footnote from the Wikipedia page about code pages. And it's like, even if we've agreed that you and me are both using an IBM PC86 computer to send each other a document in Bulgarian, we still can't agree, are we using PostScript Bulgarian or Windows Bulgarian or IBM Bulgarian? It's absolutely chaotic. And when we invented the web and email, these became mainstream, and we all started exchanging data between different computers, we needed a better system. We needed a unified coding standard, Unicode. Now, the Unicode Consortium, the Unicode Project, started in about 1988, and uh, it was established as a legal entity in 1991. And their mission statement was this, to provide a single consistent way to represent each letter and symbol needed for all human languages across all computers and devices. Now, that's a great mission statement. You know, if you're ever looking for an example of a good one, that's a really good one. All computers and devices, how do you do that? You make it good, you make it free, you give it away, you encourage everyone to use it. No patents, no copyright, no licensing. Use it, it's free. We've solved your problems, and here's the solution. All human languages, yeah, even the ancient ones, like Egyptian hieroglyphics is in there. Ancient Sumerian is in Unicode. And so that leaves us with a single consistent way to represent each letter and symbol needed for all human language. So what is a letter? What is a symbol? Now, uh, I like to try and learn a little bit of the language when I travel and visit places. And uh, sometimes that uh, leaves me feeling a little bit, uh, let me see if I get this, in Valmashitz? In Valmashitz? A little bit overwhelmed. But I'm English, I'm British, so I look at this, and my brain doesn't see the Romanian alphabet. My brain sees the English alphabet with decorations. And I think I can ignore them. And so I do. And I go, yeah, in Vilmacity. And everyone's like, no, that's not how this works. So which is it, you know? In a Romanian word, obviously Romanian word, Romanian alphabet, respect the local rules. But let's say that uh, I'm writing an article about this guy. I'm writing about Francois Borda, who is an archaeologist from France, and uh, Motley Crue, who are, they're not archaeologists, they're a rock band from Los Angeles. And so in my article, I write, Francois the archaeologist went to the Motley Crue concert. Now this, this is English, this is definitely written in English, but there are letters here which are not part of the English Latin alphabet. So what are they? Are they letters? Are they foreign letters? Is this sentence not in English anymore, or is this just decoration? Now, the reason why this matters is that so much of the information processing, so many of the conventions we take for granted in software are to do with whether two pieces of text are the same, and if they're not the same, which one comes first? So we're going to make a database. We're going to make a little database here of European cities, and we are going to put Berlin, Aachen, Zurich, Aarhus, and Erbru into our database. Now, uh, which one of these do you think is in alphabetical order? A little show of hands. Who thinks it's number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? Who thinks it's a trap? They're all in alphabetical order, depending who you are and where you're from, and what version of the alphabet you grew up with. Now, we're going to create cities, table, name, varchar, and varchar 128. We're going to put our cities in the database. We're going to do a little select stuff from cities. And there we go. We get our data back out the other side. B -A -A, not in any particular order. So let's do an order. Let's, uh, well, first, let, let's find uh, Orobro in there. So we're going to do a select star. And hang on. It's not there. I mean, we just put it, maybe it's case sensitive. Maybe we need to use capital letters. Let's try looking for Orobro with a big O. Nope, still not there. Is Orobro the same as Erbru? 
No, it's not. Not according to the default collation on this version of SQL. Now, a collation is a set of rules for controlling which strings are equal and controlling alphabetical order. If I run this query again, but I say specify the Latin general case insensitive, CI, accent insensitive, AI, collation, it goes, oh yeah, well, now they're the same. So let's select star from cities, and we're going to order by name, and we get this. And this makes sense to me as a native English speaker, because to me this is A, A, B, O, Z, and that's alphabetical order. If we do the same thing and specify the Latin collation, yeah, A, A, B, O, Z, same order. If we do the same thing, but we specify we want Finnish and Swedish alphabetical order, now in Finland and Sweden, the letter Ö, er, that first letter in Örbro, that's the 29th letter of the alphabet. Appears after all the others. So in Finland and Sweden, that's alphabetical order. We're just getting warmed up. We introduce you to Danish and Norwegian collation. Berlin, Zurich, Urbro, Aachen, Aarhus. Now, this is actually wrong. This list is not in alphabetical order. Let me tell you about Danish orthography. Now, Aarhus is Denmark's second city. Um, after the capital Copenhagen. And uh, the city of Aarhus was officially spelled Aarhus from 1948 until January 2011. In 1948, there was a thing called the Danish spelling reform. Denmark decided we want to be a little bit less like Germany and a little bit more like Sweden. So they extended their alphabet. They added these three letters to it. So they used the same alphabet as Swedish. And they made a rule that said all the places, people, companies that started with O would now be spelt with this new letter. So the city of Aarhus became the city of Aarhus, but spelt with a different letter. Then in 2011, the mayor of Aarhus thought this is interfering with their Google page rank and affecting tourism, and changed it back. But that doesn't change its position in the alphabet. So this list on the right, that list is actually in correct alphabetical order. Aachen goes at the beginning, because Aachen is not in Denmark. Aachen is in Germany, and so the rules of Danish orthography do not apply. It goes at the beginning with all the other A's. Then we have B, then we have Dublin, then we have Zurich, and then we have Aarhus at the end. And uh, the first time I ever saw this problem, somebody had a file called Aardvark on Norwegian language windows, and it appeared at the end of the list in Windows Explorer. I was like, why the? And that sent me down this little rabbit hole of digging into why is AA at the end of the list. Now, you can't get this right with the data in the database. If you actually want to get Danish and Norwegian orthography right, you need to put extra columns in to sort by that you don't show the humans. Let's go back to our friend Francois, whose name is spelled with a C with a Cedia, because Francois is French. Now, Unicode doesn't say whether this is a letter or not. What Unicode does, it gives us choices. It says, well, you can write this as this single character, which has a numeric code point, or you can take a normal ASCII-flavored letter C, and you can add this thing. This is a combining character, which says, hey, I want you to add decorations to the thing you just drew. Now, combining characters are fun because you can stack them. And you can say one of those, and one of those, and one of those, and one of those, and one of those. And if you stack up enough of these, that's how you get Zalgo text. And the Zalgo text looks very funny on Stack Overflow and also crashes some old Samsung Android phones and then you can't reboot them, which is just hilarious. But uh, we go back to our friends Motley Crue. Now, you know, making Motley Crue look stupid. Uh, the first time Motley Crue went on tour in Germany, apparently the audience were all shouting, Muetle Crue, Muetle Crue, and, and they didn't know why. They're like, why can't they say our names, man? It's like, because you wrote your name in German, you idiots. That's what it says here. But, we can write Motley Crue in two different ways. We can write that, or we can do it using a combining Unicode diuresis. Are these the same string? Well, we don't know. And Unicode doesn't tell us. What it does is say, look, you've got to choose, and you've got to choose between four different ways of comparing strings. These are called normalization forms. So the first two forms are the canonical decomposed form. Decompose means break it out into as many separate code points, take the accents off and make them into characters. And then there is canonical composed, canonical composition would do the opposite. Squash this down into the smallest number of code points you can. And then someone came along and said, all right, well, uh, the other form we've got is compatible. Hey, wait, ah, oh, crap. We already used C to stand for canonical. So uh, compatible is spelled with a K. So we got the NFKD, compatible decomposition. 
and compatible composition. And compatible means don't look at exactly which letter this is, look at the letter it's a picture of. Let me explain with an example. So there's a little snippet of code here. This is .NET code that is going to use those four different normalization forms, and it's going to do a string comparison across them. Now, if I take Motley Crue, and I build that string in two different ways, one of them just with Unicode, the other one with the combining diuresis character, and I run that through my comparison, here's the result we're going to get. They're the same length. Now, they're not the same. Well, maybe they're the same length. .NET says, yes, they're the same length, same number of bytes or same number of code points. They are not binary equivalent, but they are equal under all four Unicode normalization forms. If we take another example, like this, for example, Unicode has bubble letters. Letters of the alphabet with bubbles around them, because you want to look funky in your Twitter profile. I don't know. If we compare those two strings, it's going to say, well, uh, these two strings, they are the same length. They are not equal. They are not equal under any of the canonical forms, but the compatible forms, yes, they're equal. So if you want to build a search against the database where your users have been putting in little funky Unicode characters, you need to understand about compatibility de decomposition modes. Now, the next chapter in my personal journey with text encoding started uh, about six, seven years ago. I was at work one morning, and one of my team comes over to my desk and says, I think we've been hacked. And uh, you know, this happens all the time. I think I've been hacked. No, you haven't been hacked. Just you've, you've revealed codes on Facebook. Just put it away. Don't touch that button. But sometimes the person is like a really competent security engineer, and you're like, why do you think we've been hacked? There's Chinese in the Windows event logs. And there was. <laughs> Now, we're a British company in London using British language Windows. We have uh, maybe a few Chinese like, members in our database. No Chinese suppliers, no Chinese systems, no Chinese localization. Why is there Chinese in the event logs? So incident management 101. You, right, I want you to go tell the business, possible data breach, don't worry about it yet, we'll have an update for them in 15 minutes. You, go and check the firewall logs. Any suspicious intrusions, any kind of big data, you go and look through all the rest of the database tables. Can you find Chinese anywhere? Is this like a SQL injection attack or something? I'm going to sit back and shit post about it on Twitter. And I do, and I win, because Twitter comes straight back and somebody says, that looks like a Unicode mapping error. And then the fake Unicode account, which is lovely, pops up and says, yes, the low bits are all null. This is probably UTF-16LE being mistaken for UTF-16BE. And I look at this tweet and I think, I should probably figure out what those things are really quickly in case they're important. So I dive headfirst down the rabbit hole of Unicode encodings, and this is what I learn. Um, <laughs> Internally, Microsoft Windows, JavaScript, Java, pretty, you know, most mainstream systems, .NET, they tend to use two bytes for all the characters because it makes a lot of things fast because you have consistent, predictable string width encodings. So internally, Microsoft Windows, the word delete in memory is two bytes for each character, 16 bits. Now, if you flip the order of those bytes around, what you do is you change the numbers and you move the whole thing from basic American ASCII into the Unicode block that's used for Chinese. Uh, now, another YouTube commenter popped up and is like, uh, yeah, uh, actually, I can tell you what these mean. Um, the first one there, that's dismembering the body of livestock. Second one is climbing. A third one is textiles and fabrics. The last one is uh, putting uh, precious gems into the mouth of a corpse. Now, the funny thing about this, the day that that incident happened, somebody ran the message through Google Translate, and they came out and said, I think this might be ransomware. I think they want us to put diamonds in the mouth of a dead bird. I'm like, I don't think it's ransomware. I really don't think that's what's going on here. So that's what's happening, is we're flipping. The, the bits are getting switched over. So next question, why is Microsoft Dynamics CRM talking to Microsoft SQL Server switching from big Endian to little Endian? It wasn't. This is one of the gnarliest bugs I've ever had to track down in my entire career. We had a faulty network switch. This was running in like a virtual network in a, a private cloud. And every three minutes, the network switch was losing one byte and just disappearing, and everything else would shuffle sideways. And it would all go Chinese for three minutes, and then it would lose another byte, and it would all shuffle sideways, and it would go back to English again. This went on for about 30 hours until we finally figured out what was going on with it. It was uh, bizarre. So that's what's going on. Internally, Windows, Java, .NET, JavaScript, they're mostly using UTF-16. They're using 16 bits for every letter of the alphabet, because that means they can do you know, uh, English, Swedish, Norwegian, Romanian, Russian, Ukrainian, all these languages without having to allocate variable width storage. 
And that works locally because memory is cheap and access is fast. But when you get out onto the internet and the web, suddenly bandwidth becomes a consideration. Now, we're going to write a, a web page in Ukrainian, and it's just going to say hi. And if we write this web page in UTF-16, these are the bits that are Ukrainian Cyrillic. Those need 16 bits. The rest of it is HTML. HTML is based on 7-bit ASCII. CSS is based on 7-bit ASCII. JavaScript, unless you are genuinely evil, your JavaScript code is probably 7-bit ASCII. And so whenever you send these documents over the web, even if the web page is written in an extended alphabet, you still need to send all of those ASCII characters. So if you send web pages as UTF-16, 44% of your network bandwidth is nulls. It's you going, hey, uh, nothing, this, nothing ampersand, nothing bracket, nothing D, nothing O, nothing C, nothing T, nothing Y. But you have to send it, because if you're using UTF-16, you've got to send 16 bits for every character. And this brings us to one of, I think, the most brilliant hacks in the history of information processing. It's a thing called UTF-8. It's an encoding, came out of the Unicode Consortium. And UTF-8 says, right, take a byte, 8 bits. If your byte starts with a zero, it is 7-bit flavored ASCII, same as it's been forever. If your byte starts with a 1, it's part of a multi-byte code sequence. Anything that starts 1-0, you are in the middle of a letter. You need to backtrack. You need to rewind until you get to 1-1. One, one. And if you get 1-1-0, one, one, you are at the start of a 2-byte sequence. If you get 1-1-1-0, one, 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 you're at the start of a 3-byte sequence. If you get 1-1-1-1-0, one, 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 you're at the start of a 4-byte sequence. Now, in theory, this scales up to eight bytes. In practice, we don't do that because we don't have that many letters. And you know, maybe one day we'll make contact with extraterrestrials and we'll need to assign code points for all their alphabets and stuff. Or maybe we're just going to keep inventing new languages and new alphabets because we are inventing. There's a new alphabet that didn't exist when I was born that probably most of the people in this room have used today, and that's the emoji alphabet. Now, emoji started in Japan in about 1999. Uh, this was the original set of emojis designed by an artist called uh, Shigetaka Korita, who was working on a project for a Japanese mobile phone company. Uh, Dokomo was the phone company, and they had this thing called iMode. And iMode was like an early predecessor to smartphones. You could get like the train timetable and the weather forecast. And so they designed this little set of emoji that you could use in your messages and things. Um, and this set is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York now. Now, this was a huge hit in Japan. Within like two years, you couldn't sell a phone in Japan that didn't have emoji because everyone wanted them. So when Apple come along and they launch iPhone in Japan in 2008, it has to support emoji, which means anyone anywhere in the world can go onto their new shiny iPhone and they can change the local language to Japanese and suddenly they have these emoji characters and they start sending each other messages and emoji takes off, goes right around the world, everyone starts using it. And people start asking questions, like, uh, why is there's a pilot, and there's a chef, and there's a firefighter, and they're all men. Why are they men? Where is the female pilot in this? I'm a lady, I fly aeroplanes, where's my emoji? Why is there sushi but no tacos? I want to go for tacos, but all I can do is go for sushi. You know, people started using emoji to talk about themselves and their identity, and getting frustrated by the fact that emoji, they didn't feel like it represented them. Now, Emoji became part of Unicode in about 2010. Um, it's actually one of the few things Apple and Android have ever worked together. I mean, like, no, we're going to share this, we're going to publish it, going to make it a standard. In 2015, Unicode added a really cool feature to Emoji. They added the ability to use skin tone modifiers on things like smiley faces and thumbs up, and they did it using combining characters. So just like the C with a little sedia, they said, well, if you've got a thumbs up and you've got medium dark skin tone, you're going to get that if your device supports it. And if it doesn't, you'll get a thumbs up, and then you'll get a little question mark because it doesn't know what that character stands for yet. Now, every year, they add a whole bunch of different new characters to the Unicode emoji set, different family configurations. Now, some of these are genuinely new, like the little woolly mammoth down here, that's a new one. But all the different like Santa Claus there without a beard, most of these are created using combining characters. So the lady female astronaut emoji is a woman, a thing called a zero-width joint and then the space rocket. And if your phone knows about that, you get female astronaut. And if it doesn't, you get a lady and a rocket, and you can probably figure out what that meant. And if you want to send this emoji, 
That's a woman with the dark skin tone modifier, the zero width joiner, and the rocket. And if you're Mae Jameson, who was a mission specialist who flew the space shuttle, you're like, yes, finally, there's an emoji for me. Look at that, I'm an emoji. Now, flags are really interesting. The flag of Romania is the regional indicator symbol letter R and the regional indicator symbol letter O next to each other. And your phone sees those and goes, oh yeah, I know what that flag is. And it knows what the flag is because RO is the ISO country code assigned to Romania. England is not a country. We have a football team, but we're not a country. We are part of the United Kingdom. So the flag of England is not in the ISO country list in emoji. So the flag of England is a black flag followed by a coding sequence of five tag characters, G, B, E, N, G, Great Britain, England. The flag of Scotland, the flag of Wales, and the flag of Texas are also included using the same system. And then the pride flag, is a white flag, a zero width joiner, and a rainbow, which I think is kind of cute. Now, does anyone recognize this flag? So this is officially, this is the flag of the Republic of China, which is a small island nation off the coast of the Asian mainland, which most people know as Taiwan. Big China, the People's Republic of China, they don't like this because they think that Taiwan should be part of China. Taiwan says, no, we do not want to be part of China. In mainland China, this flag is a symbol of support for Taiwanese independence. So if you go onto your iPhone, I can send text messages, including the flag of Taiwan. But then if I go into my regional settings, and I change my phone setting to China mainland, and I go back into my emoji message, and I refresh it, it's disappeared. The flag doesn't appear anymore. I can't type it, and it doesn't render. This is the deal Apple made to be allowed to sell iPhone in China, in the People's Republic of China. Now there's about 1.2, 1.3 billion people in China. That's a big market, gonna buy a lot of iPhones. This is what Apple did to deal with that. Now uh, there's a version of this talk up on YouTube where somebody has commented, you know, great talks, thanks for supporting Ukraine. And somebody else on Windows says, uh, hey, I assume that would be a flag on a different operating system. Windows has no regional flags. None, doesn't support any of them. Windows is not going near the, are we allowed to show the flag of Taiwan? They're like, no, we're not, <laughs> you sort it out. We are not interested. There are only three flags supported in the Windows operating system. There's the gay pride flag, there's the pirate flag, skull and crossbones, and there is the checkered flag for winning a Formula One race. So Windows, Microsoft's official position on flags is that gay pirates are winning and we don't care about anybody else. <laughs> Which is a pretty enlightened statement, you know. <laughs> Now, the last thing I want to end with, uh, with this talk today is a, a little kind of personal story about something interesting I discovered. First time that I went and, and visited Ukraine uh, about six, seven years ago now. Um, I'm walking around and then a couple of years later I got to go to Russia, I got to go to Belarus, and I couldn't read any Cyrillic. I hadn't started learning any of that stuff. I was wondering, I couldn't read anything. Like I couldn't read restaurant menus. I'm like, oh, I, I guess this is what it's like just not being able to read. And I realized I could read the license plates on the cars. I couldn't read restaurant menus, the signs, I couldn't navigate the metro, I couldn't read a map, but I could read all the license plates. And I said to someone, you know, why are the license plates in English? And they looked at me and went, they're not in English? And I went digging. And I discovered that there's a thing called the 1965, the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. Same year as ASCII, bunch of countries all got together and they signed this convention about license plates on cars. And one of the clauses that they all signed up to is they said, look, if we're gonna drive our cars into each other's countries and we're gonna cross borders, we need to be able to read each other's license plates. So license plates will only use the Latin alphabet. Now, license plates in the Soviet Union in 1965 looked like this. That ain't the Latin alphabet. And I'm guessing there was a meeting at some point where uh, they, they, the Soviet Union had signed this treaty and someone said, you know, comrade, what if we need to drive cars out of the Soviet Union? And they looked at them and went, you don't drive car out of Soviet Union. If you did, if you could get travel papers to take your car out of the Soviet Union, they'd give you temporary plates at the border and you'd bring them back because otherwise, you know, bad things might happen. But then when the Soviet Union disintegrated in the 90s, all the member states became independent and they all overhauled their traffic registration systems. And the cars now license plates look like this. And what they did 
is they took the Cyrillic and the Latin alphabet, and uh, so the version they use, because there's slight differences, the version they use in Ukraine, they took the overlap of Ukrainian, Cyrillic, and Latin. They took that set of characters. Now, they aren't the same letters, but they are the same shapes. And they took and they said, that's what we are going to use on our license plates. Now, if you rearrange those letters in English, they spell Pike Matchbox. Now, I want you to remember that, because next time somebody says to you, hey, uh, can you send me that file as plain text? You can say to them, do you know about Pike Matchbox? And if they say, oh, yeah, yeah, then they've seen the talk. And they know about Big Endian, Little Endian, 7-bit, UTF-8, UTF-16, the Danish spelling reform, teleprinters. And they're probably going to send you a file which is just ordinary 7-bit ASCII that you're going to be open, able to open without any problems. And if they say no, what's Pike Matchbox? Then they're going to send you a file that works on their machine, and you're going to have absolutely no idea what to do with it. Now, I'd like to just dedicate this talk to a, a guy called John Doe on YouTube, because John watched the entire talk. John sat through the whole spelling reform and the World War II and you know, the history of the Soviet Union and everything, and learned about the way in which all of these things have shaped the software that we use every day. And then John left a comment that said, leave politics out of software, thank you. Thank you for listening, folks. John Doe, you're an idiot. Multimask, CodeCamp.